Hello, and thank you for joining me for episode 35 of the Aviation News Talk podcast. Coming up in the news, an airliner takes evasive action to avoid a GA aircraft near a major U.S. city. And there's been a lot of talk this past week about the NFL, but you probably haven't heard this story. It's the FAA saying that it's okay to fly banners with rude comments over a particular U.S. football stadium. And we have not one but two stories of pilots saying that general aviation is being wrecked by regulation and fees in their countries, and one of those countries just had a major meltdown of their radar system last week. And a former FAA control tower in a big U.S. city is becoming a restaurant. Then later we'll be talking about when you have to switch from GPS to a VOR navigation receiver when you're flying a VOR localizer ILS or LDA approach. Welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk about, hey, what else? General aviation. I'm Max Truscott. I'm here to help you fly more safely as a pilot or maybe a student pilot by sharing my over 40 years of experience as a certificated pilot, author, and 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year when I was selected to represent the 96,000 flight instructors here in the U.S. Now, last week, we talked about how to prioritize your activities when flying IFR and about how to work your way through an instrument approach chart to brief an approach. If you missed that episode, please check it out. We have so much coming up, and it all starts now. From aeronews.net comes the story that a United Airlines Boeing 737 en route to Chicago O'Hare from Vancouver, Canada, on Monday reportedly had to take evasive action to avoid colliding with a glider near the destination airport. The CBC reports that the FAA said in an emailed statement that the captain of Flight 246 reported seeing the glider near Rockford, Illinois, and climbed 400 feet to avoid hitting it. The pilot also reportedly took other evasive action to avoid the collision. A passenger said that the plane entered a steep right bank without warning, and he said, quote, No one screamed, but it was enough that many people grabbed their seats and their armrest. I couldn't see what was happening, but I knew that it was out of the ordinary. On Twitter, this passenger also included an image from flight radar that shows the aircraft initially in a left turn near the Wisconsin-Illinois border. He said that the second turn, which is a tight loop to the right shown just north of Rockford, was where the incident occurred. The FAA says that the incident is under investigation. And from defense.gov, that's the U.S. Pentagon, a new story that says Air National Guard restores air traffic control in Puerto Rico. They say that Air National Guard units from Puerto Rico, Illinois, and Wisconsin all teamed up to help restore FAA-managed air traffic control operations on Puerto Rico as part of their joint response in the wake of Hurricane Maria. They say the loss of power and communications required that all aircraft traffic be controlled visually and that only one aircraft could arrive or leave the island every 10 minutes, which is six per hour to ensure the aircraft were safely separated. And they said that normally an airport of that size can handle about 45 flights an hour, and that limited the supply chain of critical materials and personnel. Uh, they go on to say that once they got basic communications back up and running, the number of flights taking place began to climb from six per hour to 18 per hour two days after the storm to more than 30 per hour. And Air Force Captain Jeff Rutkowski says, we had to come up with multiple solutions to every challenge. We'd try something and the first solution wouldn't work. We'd get something started and realize that a better idea came along and we'd switch to that. We're dealing with a scenario where so many things were damaged, we really had to get creative. Now, he's from Wisconsin's Air National Guard, JSIC, J-I-S-C-C. And if you wonder what that is, from AFCEA.org comes an explanation that, that JSIC is a joint incident site communications capability, includes interoperable communications modules that can be quickly deployed to an incident. And they say that they can be set up inside a command tent to link other Defense Department and civilian agencies at an incident site. Uh, according to that website, if they need to talk to a sheriff in a particular state or county, they can, and that the JSIC acts as a bridge to talk to whatever radio that sheriff's department has. And from AINonline.com, news that Representative Bill Schuster was on the House floor again today in his continuing campaign to try and pass a bill that will privatize air traffic control. He says he expects the bill to receive House consideration, quote, in the coming days, and he defended the proposal as carefully drafted texts with the backing of groups such as pilots, flight attendants, and air traffic controller unions. 
He did express frustration with the opposition from business and from general aviation, accusing opponents of spreading false claims about the bill. He stressed that every request from business in GA has been included in the bill, short of scrapping the proposal altogether, which actually would be a good idea. He said the bill was real reform that comes at no cost or harm to business jets, but get this, he had to add in that everyone who flies commercially subsidizes business jets, so he's taking a slap at them as well. He also took aim at manufacturing and said the status quo will harm U.S. competitiveness and cost jobs without, of course, offering any evidence of that. Now, Representative Peter DeFazio, the ranking Democrat, told reporters last week, I will continue to follow Schuster around and talk to people who get bad information and think that privatization is a good idea. He noted that Schuster has not yet been able to get the votes and the Senate has no interest in it. And in related international news, we have stories from both New Zealand and Australia. The first one from EAA.org says that an American pilot in New Zealand says the system there has wrecked general aviation. He's an American citizen and he's an EAA member, and he wrote to his U.S. congressional representatives with a prime example of how ATC privatization smothers GA activity. He wrote, I love flying in Colorado in cherished airports such as Boulder, Longmont, and Erie, to name a few. He says, since I came to New Zealand, I have practically quit flying because the system is so bad. He reports that the New Zealand system, in the form of state-owned enterprises, that's SOE, has no obligation to citizen pilot complaints. He reports that there's a long list of obstacles to flying and a fee attached to everything. He says, quote, the only GA operations that are barely surviving are the Part 141 schools that train people to be airline pilots and leave their customers with horrific student loans. He left his representatives with this simple plea, quote, please don't kill private aviation in Colorado. And from Australia, this comes from the Australian.com.au, a story about Dick Smith. Now, if you don't know who he is, he's an Australian entrepreneur and the founder of Dick Smith Electronics and many other businesses and also an avid aviator. Story says that Dick is urging the release of a delayed landmark report into general aviation, and he says it's important to get this report out now. The report apparently talks about the decline in that sector. Now, the Australian confirmed that this report by the Bureau of Infrastructure, Transport, and Regional Economics is now expected to go to the transport minister by the end of the month. The report was commissioned last year by Mr. Chester, who's the transport minister, who said it would, quote, help get the public policy right to support growth in the sector. Now, Dick Smith said the report has to be released urgently so you can start fixing the problem. He reiterated his fears for the sector. He said GA is nearly destroyed in this country. It is just the most terrible situation. That report was initially supposed to be completed by June 30th, but Mr. Chester's office said that the Bureau, which is also called BITTER, B-I-T-R-E, was still finalizing it. And the Australian Aviation Association Forum Chairman Greg Russell said there has been, quote, a lot of discussion about the industry's warnings about its decline, and the BITTER study was important for getting hard numbers on the situation. He said anecdotally that some of his member organizations were warning the industry, quote, continues to slide while we are waiting for the the report to become available. And AOPA Australia Executive Director Benjamin Morgan said he was fed up waiting for action on the decline in the sector. He said, quote, more businesses have closed, more people have left the industry. And he said, what we need is the government to have a position on these things. And by the way, we have a story here that was sent to us last week, but didn't get a chance to use. It came from Hamish Keb, and it's about a failure at Sydney Airport of their radar system for four hours on Monday morning, just as their school holidays were starting and travel was heavy. Here's what part of it sounded like over the ATC frequencies at Sydney. On its 565, uh, uh, no, nothing at this stage. There's been a total radar failure within the Sydney Basin. So there's a nationwide ground stop. The only arrivals that are being processed are those that are airborne. And um, I don't believe we're accepting any departures until the radar is back online. You can't claim that all the same. Uh, sorry, say again. The estimate of the delay. You got a piece of string? Yeah, fair enough. No, the decks are working on it. Every time they reboot it, it locks up again. So, uh, yeah, in, until it's reliable, uh, there'll be no movements. Now, Hamish is a regular listener to this show, and he writes that he makes a two-week trip every year to the United States to do cross-country flights out of the Reed Hillview Airport, which he says correctly is just down the bay from your airfield. It is such a brilliant country to fly in. In Australia, small aircraft are treated like leprosy. Hmm. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for sharing that, Hamish. 
And from AviationPros.com comes an update to a story we did back in episode 22, which is about the four-seat Sunflyer aircraft. They call it the Sunflyer 4. They announced now that they've got 10 deposits uh, for this aircraft, and this is a four-seat IFR-capable version of their Sunflyer 2, both of which are electric aircraft. Now, the 4 is a 46-inch wide cabin, 38-foot wingspan, ballistic parachute system, gross weight of 2,700 pounds, full payload of 800 pounds for pilot and passengers with a projected flight endurance of four hours, which is pretty amazing for an all-electric aircraft. They say at $5 of electricity per flight hour and under $20 operating cost per flight, it'll run completely on batteries with an operating costs five times lower than costs associated with similar aircraft such as the Cessna 182 or SR-20. So best wishes for the Sunflyer 4. And from flyingmagazine.com comes a story that Bruce Landsberg is going to be joining the NTSB. He was recently named as a White House nominee to join the board. And I should add that Bruce is a good friend. I've known him for quite some time, and I think he's going to be an awesome uh, member of the board. Now, we had him out here a year ago as the keynote speaker for our accident-wise safety event that brings about 250 pilots to the historic Moffett Field with the blimp hangers uh, every year. So he is incredibly knowledgeable, and he says according to this article, that he thinks his lifelong experience in GA safety will offer a real benefit to the board. He says, quote, I've also spent most of my life working on that delicate balance between government and industry relations, as well as in research, scientific, and advocacy roles, much like the NTSBs. And the article notes that he spent about 22 years at AOPA, first as executive director of AOPA's Air Safety Institute, and later as the president uh, when they split that out as AOPA's Air Safety Foundation. Now, he credits his dad's decision to give him a copy of Robert Buck's famous book, Weather Flying, with just the nudge he needed to learn to fly. He eventually earned an ATP certificate and is a current flight instructor with more than 6,000 hours. Previously, he's held positions with Cessna Aircraft, Flight Safety International, NATCA, and even spent a year with Flying Magazine. He says, however, that his most notorious job to date was as a missile launch officer with the U.S. Air Force. So, Bruce, you have our congratulations. We can't wait to hear that you've been confirmed for a five-year term on the board of the NTSB. And last week, we talked about the need to check your apps for compatibility if you're an iPhone or iPad customer before upgrading your iOS to iOS 11. So I thought it was kind of amusing when I got an email yesterday that said from ForeFlight, Dear customer, compatibility testing between ForeFlight and iOS 11.0.1 is complete, and we're issuing the all clear to ForeFlight customers with an important caveat for turboprop and jet pilots, which I'll get to in just a moment. But then today on ForeFlight's Facebook page, they said, we are performing compatibility testing between ForeFlight and the newly released iOS 11.0.2 to ensure that everything is working smoothly. We will update this post with an all clear when testing is completed. So the net of that is okay to go to 11.0.1, not okay to go to 11.0.2. Now, the problem they found was that for devices on iOS 11 using Bluetooth or plug-in GPS receivers for position data in ForeFlight, it's possible that the GPS signal will get lost when it's carried on an aircraft exceeding 300 knots. Now, this issue does not appear on slower aircraft or with devices that provide more than just GPS, such as a Stratus or an installed uh, Garmin avionics. And I read a a post somewhere else today where someone said they suspect that 11.0.2 cures that problem, but who knows? It's all speculation. And now to that story we talked about in the beginning of the news about flying rude banners over a football sports stadium, deadspin.com. Now, that's a sports news site. As a great headline, they say FAA gives pilots thumbs up to fly rude banners over Chargers home games. Now, outside of the U.S., please bear with me and I'll explain a couple of things here. The San Diego Chargers have been in San Diego for 56 years. But originally, they were in Los Angeles when they were first founded back in 1960 for one year. Their owner, Dean Spanos, moved the team earlier this year back to Los Angeles. As you can imagine, the fans are not happy. So here's the story. Owner Dean Spanos and the Los Angeles Chargers recently asked the FAA to grant what's called a TFR over the StubHub Center, which is their new stadium in Los Angeles, on game days, arguing that an airplane flying over an arena pack with NFL fans is a dangerous problem. Opposition. Of course, that's not the real issue. The real issue is that one of the planes doing the 
flying over the stadium, owned by disgruntled Chargers fan Joseph McRae, is towing banners carrying anti-Dean Spanos messages. And unfortunately for Spanos, the FAA has now reportedly denied his request, meaning that disgruntled San Diego fans and fans of high comedy can now fly taunting banners over StubHub Center as often as traffic, uh, air traffic laws will permit. Most embarrassing, the reason for the decline? Well, the FAA doesn't grant TFRs for stadiums that hold fewer than 30,000 people. And at their last sellout game, well, just 25,000 people. Sorry about that. Hey, if you want to see one of those banners, go to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, and you can see some pictures there of the airplanes flying over the stadium. And finally, our story about an air traffic control tower becoming a restaurant. This comes to us from kdvr.com. That's a TV station located in Denver, Colorado. Now, old timers will remember the old Stapleton Airport. I remember flying back into it in the early 70s. I was a teenager and I was going to visit a friend of mine who had moved from Pennsylvania to Denver for Christmas. But that tower, uh, pardon me, that airport was closed back in 1995 and replaced by the new Denver International Airport. Well, according to Punchbowl Social, and that's the uh, restaurant chain, which is based in Denver, their founder says the tower represents the last assembled bricks of the Stapleton Airport, and they're going to turn it into a restaurant. They say after years of uh, construction and planning, architects figured out a way to transform the old building materials and control tower, and they kept a lot of the original materials. Inside, you will find Punchbowl essentials like bars, dining areas, and a bowling alley. Now, the first two floors will be part of the restaurant, and the third floor will be used as office space for the company. Unfortunately, the tower itself won't be open to diners because it's not ADA compliant, which is the American Disabilities Act. Punchbowl Social says if everything goes as planned, the restaurant should open at the end of October. And that's the news for this week. Coming up in a moment, just when do you have to switch from GPS to the VOR navigation receiver when you're flying a VOR localizer, ILS, or LDA approach? Plus a listener question. A low-time private pilot had what he called a near miss when he mismanaged a go-around, and he's asking about are there any structured recurrent training programs that he can follow for ongoing training in a Cessna 172? Stick around. We'll be right back. And welcome back. Before we talk about when to switch the GPS to the nav radio when flying a non-GPS approach, let me give you a few quick updates. Last week, I renewed my CFI certificate for folks who are not uh, CFIs. That process is something that has to be done every 24 months when you're CFI. And get this, if you don't do it on time, you lose your entire CFI certificate. You then have to go back through the entire process, do a complete new check ride to get your CFI. And that's a lot of work. So most people who, once they get their CFI certificate, do whatever it takes to hang on to it. Now, it turns out there are 10 different ways to renew your CFI certificate. And we'll talk about that as a separate topic someday. But over the years, I found what works really easily for me is to do it with wings activity. So instead of giving flight reviews, sometimes a pilot will participate in the wings program. And all I need to do is give uh, wings flight training to five different pilots over a period of two years. And it's an automatic renewal. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, what was not so straightforward was using the IACRA system. If you're a student pilot and you haven't taken a check ride yet, boy, do you have a treat to look forward to, which is going into IACRA, I A C R A dot F A A dot gov to fill in an application for any check ride that you take or any CFI renewal that you do. Well, these days you have to make an appointment at the FISDO to renew your CFI. And my local FISDO only does it on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Those are the only days you can make an appointment to come in. And I went down and part of the process is that once the inspector uh, does his work on the computer, he has you sign in on the computer under your IACRA uh, sign-on. And I unfortunately blew it. I kept trying and trying and trying, could not sign on to it, even though I had successfully signed on to it at home. So it locked me out after three tries, unable to uh, immediately recover a password. So that was it. And I had to come back again two days later 
for uh, another try at it. And when I started entering my passwords again into IACRA, same problem. Finally, what I stopped and realized was it was asking for a username. I was putting in an email address. So it was not looking for my email address. It was looking for the username, which I happened to have with me. So, oh, well, these things are never simple. I'm sure I was confusing it because I often go into the faasafety.gov website. And for that one, I use an email address. Anyway, CFI certificate has been renewed. I'm good for another 24 months. And surveys. If you haven't taken our survey this month, go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash survey. I just put up the new survey on portable ADSB receivers today. And it asks basically, uh, do you use an ADSB receiver? If so, which one are you using? Have you had any issues with it? What do you like? What do you not like about it? And if you're uh, thinking about buying one, what model are you thinking of buying? And so we'll go through all those results a month from now and uh, find out what people are using out there. By the way, we have just closed out the survey that we've been running for two months on what flight planning tools you use when you plan a longer flight. So thanks to everybody who took that survey, over 80 of you. And I'll use that information as the basis for another show coming up sometime in the near future. And speaking of the show, I hope you're enjoying it because it comes to you free. We have a lot of folks, though, who help support the show through Patreon. And that's a way where you can go out and send us a few dollars a month to help support all the work we do here. I know it's hard to believe, but uh, it actually does cost money to put this on. And so I appreciate all of your support. And we have one new supporter this month. A big thank you to Joel Newman for going out and signing up on the page. By the way, out there on the page, you can also, prior to these shows coming out, read some of the news stories ahead of time. Time. And you probably don't know this, but I really only just read a small portion of each of these news stories. And so sometimes you're going to see the full story when you go out here. So, for example, the story we talked about from the Defense Department, I did not include uh, when I read this story earlier on the show, a really interesting quote. They said, referring to the air traffic control problems in Puerto Rico, we had a hole in the sky over Puerto Rico. It was a giant hole in the highway in the sky. We had to fix that hole before we could bring an aid to the people of Puerto Rico. Of course, I've also posted the story about Dean Spanos of the uh, San Diego Chargers, and you can see the banner uh, with what it says about him that's being flown over the stadium. Just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, and I chose that because you're all awesome listeners. So go on out and uh, take a look and see what we've got on the site there. And stick around because in seven seconds, we'll be back. Welcome back. Now we're going to get down into the nitty gritty of when can you use GPS on a instrument approach such as an ILS or VOR. And last week we talked about briefing the approach. And I said that one of the first things you should do is to check the title of the approach up in the upper right hand corner of the approach chart. And you want to see is GPS listed in the title. For example, if you look there and you see a title which just says VOR 21 approach, or maybe it says VOR 21 or GPS approach. Well, if it's the latter case, it's pretty obvious you can use GPS in lieu of a VOR signal for the entire approach. But what's less clear is when can you use GPS for some portion of the approach if it just says VOR21 and doesn't have GPS in the title of the approach. Now, what makes it even more confusing is that the answer about when you can use GPS, well, it's different for VOR and NDB approaches than it is for ILS and localizer approaches. Now, this confusion is really surprising when you consider that the ubiquitous IFR GPS receiver, the venerable Garmin 430, was introduced 20 years ago in 1997. They've got more than 100,000 of the 430s and 530s shipped, still has the largest installed base of any IFR-capable GPS. Even though it's been around all that long, pilots are still asking just basic questions like, when should I use load versus activate? Or when do I have to switch to VLOC, which would be the VOR on an ILS or VOR approach? Now, a lot of pilots will ask their CFIs, but it's been challenging for them to keep up as the answer to this question continues to change. Now, I should mention these are the kinds of things I discuss in my Max Trust Guts GPS and WAS instrument flying handbook. So if you really want to know everything there is to know about GPS-related approaches, just get a copy of the book. Call 800-247-6553. Now, I want to start by saying you want to be very careful about what sources of information you use when trying to figure out what is legal when flying 
flying IFR. You're going to hear lots of well-intended opinions from pilot friends, random Facebook posts, and yes, even your CFI, uh, who might not, by the way, be an expert on GPS or have kept up with the continual FAA rule changes that occur in this area. Remember, all of these opinions, eh, they don't mean squat unless they're backed up by the underlying FAA regulations. So let me start by telling you which regulations we're talking about today. You can find them in FAA Advisory Circular AC 90-108 and in the AIM or the Aeronautical Information Manual, you want to refer to Section 1-2-3, subparagraphs C4 and C5. And by the way, that section was last updated in May 26th of 2016, so you'll need a pretty new aim to, uh, to get that information. So let's just make this simple. Let's talk first about approaches with localizer signals like ILSs. We'll talk about VOR and DBs and all that stuff uh, later on. So the first reference for that is going to be AC 90-108. And it says that for an ILS localizer LDA or localizer back course, that an RNAV system, for example, a GPS, cannot be used for lateral navigation, that's left and right guidance, on localizer base courses, which of course would include localizer back courses, without reference to raw localizer data. Now that means as soon as you turn on to a localizer or ILS, you must display course guidance from your nav radio. On the Garmin 43530, that means as soon as you turn on the localizer, you must push the CDI button so that VLOC is displayed, which means you're now looking at guidance from the navigation radio. Now, I originally wrote about this on a blog post for AOPA, and a friend emailed me suggesting that maybe I'd misinterpreted AC 90-101 and that I'd come to the wrong conclusion about needing to switch to localizer data as soon as you turn on the final approach course. So I went to the source for clarification. I contacted AFS 470, which is the department within FAA headquarters, and they quickly responded confirming that, yes, pilots must use raw localizer data. That is, you must be using the NAVRA Radio, not the GPS, for primary guidance along the entire localizer. So the moment you turn on it, you must have that guidance. Now, if you wish, you can monitor GPS data as you fly along a localizer. However, it cannot be used for primary navigation, and you certainly can't have an autopilot track the GPS in lieu of tracking a localizer. The pilot must have raw localizer data displayed on their primary instrumentation, and they must use that localizer data for primary navigation. Now, for a lot of people, if you're mostly just flying ILSs into the same few airports, you know, your approach to this might be pretty simple. You might just say, well, the CDI just switches automatically to VLOC, that is, it switches from GPS to the VOR, as I'm about to intercept the final approach course. Now, that is true for some of the ILSs out there some of the time, but not for all ILS approaches and not for VOR approaches. And it's true only if you've turned on the ILS CDI auto capture in the Garmin 430 or 530's AUX group. Now, this automatic switching for ILSs only occurs if you intercept the final approach course between 2 and 15 miles outside of the final approach fix, the FAF. So for example, if you get a bad vector from a controller and you're brought into the ILS closer than 2 miles outside the FAF, it's not going to switch automatically. It's also not going to switch automatically if you're brought into the localizer more than 15 miles out from the FAF. Now, that's not a problem for most ILSs, but for a really long ILS with a very large descent, you know, you drop down maybe 5,000 feet along the ILS. We've got a couple examples of those, the ILS-31 at Salinas, California, and the ILS-32 right at Moffett Field, California. In both of these cases, the CDI won't switch automatically as you join the final approach course because you're just too far out. In these cases, you may need to switch manually. And of course, you always need to manually switch it for any non-ILS approach that uses the nav radio. So for example, if you're flying a localizer, a VOR, a VOR DME, an LDA, yeah, you remember LDAs, right? The localizer type directional aid. Anyway, any of those things, including localizer back course approaches, you're going to have to manually switch the CDI yourself. Now, by the way, just as an aside, if when you join an ILS or any GPS approach with vertical guidance, if you're using the autopilot's approach mode, the CDI needle for the localizer, that's your left-right guidance, 
has to center and has to be captured by the autopilot before the glide slope or the glide path centers and is captured by the autopilot. So if you're being vectored by ATC and they didn't vector you out far enough, it's possible for the glide slope needle to center before the CDI needle centers for the localizer of the GPS. Now, if that happens, you're either going to need to disconnect the autopilot and hand fly the approach, or you could switch the autopilot quickly to vertical speed mode and then enter a vertical speed somewhere between maybe 500 and 8 or 900 feet per minute, which should allow you to eventually capture the glide soap provided that you've slowed down. Remember, anytime you're having trouble getting down, just slow down as that gives you more time to get down. And now let's switch gears and stop talking about ILS approaches because the answer about when to switch from GPS to your nav radio is different if you're not flying a localizer based approach and instead are flying a VOR, a VOR DME, or even an NDB approach. The original guidance we had on this also came from AC 90-108, but it was a little incomplete, and it came from section 8.B, but now we have new guidance from the AIM. Let's talk about the old guidance from 8.B. It says that an RNAV system, for example, a GPS, cannot be used as a substitution for the nav aid, for example, a VOR or NDB, providing lateral guidance for the final approach segment. Now, the final approach segment always starts at the FAF, or Final Approach Fix, which is marked with a Maltese cross on your instrument charts. So on a VOR or an NDB approach, you can fly all the way to the FAF using just GPS before you need to switch the CDI or HSI needle to the nav radio. Under this original guidance, if you fly past the FAF without switching to the VOR needle, you've just busted your check ride and the regulations if you were to do it for real on an IFR flight plan. But the aeronautical information the AIM has since added more clarity to this. If you go to section 1-2-3, paragraph C5, it now says, Use of a suitable RNAV system as a means to navigate on the final approach segment of an instrument approach procedure based on a VOR, TACAN, or NDB signal is allowable. The underlying nav aid must be operational and the nav aid monitored for the final approach segment alignment. So that tells us now that for a VOR or NDB approach, you can now use GPS for the entire approach, even if GPS is not listed in the title of the approach. So in our example, if the title of the approach is VOR21 and GPS is not in the title, you can still now use GPS for the entire approach, but with one caveat. And that is that the VOR or NDB signal must be in service and you must monitor that signal for the final approach course. So if you're flying a glass cockpit aircraft with an HSI, you can have GPS on the HSI course pointer and have it coupled to the autopilot as long as you also display a bearing pointer for the VOR or the NDB during the final approach segment that starts at the FAF. Now, in a more conventional aircraft with two CDIs, one is going to display the GPS signal while the other displays the VOR signal. So now you know. You have to use the ILS signal for primary guidance as soon as you turn on to an approach, and you have to at least monitor a VOR signal by the time you reach the FAF if you're flying a VOR approach. But should you display these needles earlier? Yeah, my answer is emphatically yes. You know, waiting until the last possible time to switch the CDI or HSI to the nav radio rarely makes any sense. My guidance to clients is that when the controller first begins issuing vectors, meaning you're no longer using the GPS for primary guidance, that's the time to switch the CDI or HSI to the nav radio, unless of course you're flying a GPS approach. That gives you time to verify that the course is set correctly before you join the approach course. Now, I saw a great example of why that's important while I was teaching in a Cirrus Pilot Proficiency Program, or CPPP, in Concord, California. One of the attendees I flew with didn't switch the HSI to the nav radio until the moment he turned on the final approach course for the LDA runway 19R at Concord. At that time, I noticed that the HSI's course pointer was incorrectly set for 191 degrees rather than the 181 degrees required for the approach. But I didn't say anything because I wanted to see if and when he would catch the air. Now, had he made the switch earlier, he would have had more time to review his setup and possibly catch his air. 
Well, the needles remained centered, though it was still pointed 10 degrees away from our heading. And as we had crossed the final approach fix, he asked, now do I turn 10 degrees to follow the pink line to the airport? Now, I was absolutely stunned that he came up with that as a possibility, since localizer signals are always beamed out in a straight line with no turns. Clearly, he knew that there was some kind of a problem with the conflicting information he was seeing, but he never considered the possibility that the course was set incorrectly. Now, the mantra I teach clients is to review Morse, Source, and Course as part of their setup for an instrument approach. There's no need, of course, to check the Morse code ID or to set the CDI course when you're flying in a GPS approach, but doing all these things is absolutely essential to check and set anytime you're using the nav radio. So you might still be wondering, why do we have to switch to the nav radio as soon as we turn on to an ILS or localizer, but we can wait until the final approach fix to begin monitoring the VOR signal on a VOR approach? Well, consider an instrument approach with a VOR at the final approach fix. You might guess that when you're on the approach outside the VOR, a GPS signal would keep you closer to the center line than a VOR signal. But that's only true when you're more than six nautical miles from the VOR. Because at that point, the GPS is going to be in terminal mode and full-scale CDI deflection is going to be plus and minus one nautical mile which exactly matches the plus and minus 10 degrees full-scale deflection for a VOR signal at that distance. So six miles is probably close to the average length of an intermediate segment. And while I have trouble saying these words, the VOR would actually be more precise for navigating the last six miles to the FAF. And yes, I know a VOR signal scallops around a lot, but usually not that much when you're relatively close to a VOR. Now, the real benefit of GPS accuracy when flying a VOR approach occurs when you're flying the initial segment, almost all of which would be more than six nautical miles from a VOR at the FAF. Not only would GPS keep you closer to the center line, but more scalloping occurs on a VOR signal at that distance. Now, it's a little tougher to do the same analysis on an ILS or localizer approach, since the beam width of the localizer varies between about 3 and 6 degrees, depending upon the particular installation. But suffice it to say that any approach with a localizer will have a more narrow beam width, keeping you closer to the center line than a VOR approach when at the same distance from the antenna site. And just remember that localizers are more precise, so the FAA wants you to start using the nav radio as soon as you turn on to one because it's more precise. But VORs are less precise, so you don't have to switch to the nav radio until you reach the FAF. I hope that clears up your understanding of when you can use GPS on a non-GPS approach. Coming up next, lots of listener feedback and a question. One listener wants to know, are there any structured recurrent training programs that he can follow? We'll be right back. And welcome back. Let's see, no new reviews in the Apple Podcast app this week, but I did go out to Stitcher, and that's something you might use, for example, if you're using an Android phone. And there is a review from Jim Pittman, who says in part that this podcast is now one of his favorites. So thanks for that, Jim. And here comes a feedback from Mark in North Carolina. He says, I heard you say that FlyQ was your go-to app to get traffic pattern altitudes, but use caution. If the little E in a circle is up next to the TPA, it is not based on official sources. It just adds a thousand feet to the field elevation. I have already seen two instances just in my local area where this is wrong, namely KSPA, which has an 800 foot AGL TPA for piston aircraft and KIPJ, which has an 1,800-foot TPA instead of the more logical 1,900 feet that FlyQ suggests. Love the podcast. Glad to be a supporter. Well, thanks, Mark. I pulled out my app, and sure enough, my home field has a little E next to the TPA, and it's off by 300 feet. So at Palo Alto, it says TPA is 1,100 feet. We actually have two TPAs there, 800 feet on the base side and 1,000 feet on the city side. So really happy you pointed that out to me. And this comes from uh, Reinhardt. 
Reinhardt says, in your September 22 podcast, you asked for feedback on your coverage of the hurricane relief efforts. I've been thoroughly enjoying all of your episodes, but I have to say those three were some of my favorites. I thought it was a great illustration of the community that pilots are a part of, and it was fun to share it with my wife. Very inspiring interviews. Thanks for that, Reinhardt. And uh, Tom in uh, California says, I'm a student pilot approaching my check ride on October 14th. And Tom, I think I know who you're going to be flying with based on the city you're in. I enjoyed your episode on avoiding anxiety. I feel reasonably confident and well-prepared, and your comments helped keep things in perspective. I know you like aviation tech, so I thought I would mention an app I use that I find useful. Cloud Ahoy, that's uh, Cloud A-H-O-Y, Cloud Ahoy is a flight tracking app geared to student pilots. It records your flight using GPS and then allows you to debrief it with a very smart debrief web page that understands all the typical maneuvers a student pilot has to perform. Cloud Ahoy will import track logs from ForeFlight in addition to its own recording. I don't work for Cloud Ahoy. I just like the app. Tom, thanks so much for sharing that. And here's a comment I ran across today that will be useful to anybody who uses the iPad, though this is written specifically about ForeFlight. This was written by my friend Greg Brown, who was the 2000 National CFI of the Year. And he has a closed group on Facebook that you can apply to be in that's called Greg Brown's Student Pilot Pep Talk Group. He wrote, I wrote to ForeFlight this morning asking if it was normal that my iPad charger can't keep up when I'm running ForeFlight with Bluetooth ADSB in traffic and weather. I thought some of you might be interested in the following response. Bottom line, don't take off with a mostly discharged iPad running all these features and expect to charge it while using in flight. And here's the response he got. Quote, what you are experiencing is normal because of the power demands of the ForeFlight Mobile. Our testing has shown that if you have the iPad screen brightness turned up, that has a very big impact on battery life and the ability for a charger to make headway on battery charging when ForeFlight Mobile is running. If you reduce your brightness setting under settings, even a little, say by 20 to 40% of the slider, then that will have a significant impact on how fast the battery power is consumed. That may allow the charger to either increase the battery percentage or at least reduce the rate of power consumption. So a great tip there. Make sure your brightness is turned down. Otherwise, your iPad's going to be consuming a lot of energy. And here's a note from John in Arizona. He said, uh, some time ago, I sent you an email concerning the rapid speed at which you talked. I now have to write and apologize since my son-in-law pointed out the fact that I had my podcast app set for 2x speed. Now I can listen and absorb your lessons easier. Thank you and keep up the great work. John, glad you figured it out. And certainly all of this tech uh, confounds all of us at least some of the time. And here's a question that comes in from Eric in Oregon. He writes in part, I am a low time VFR private pilot looking to make sure that I stay safe and I'm trying to find out what the best way is to do that. I am part of a flying club and I fly a 172 currently, but I may be able to purchase my own plane within a couple of years, possibly a Cirrus or question mark. Now, I guess he's still trying to decide there. A few months ago, I had a near miss when I met wind shear on short final, which resulted in a very poor go around. I had never had to do a go around in such a stressful condition before. The runway was only 2,700 feet, and as I tried to climb, tall trees about 2,000 feet beyond the runway came quickly. I pulled flaps up too quickly and forgot to turn off the carb heat. I found a clearing through the trees and made it, but it left me thinking I need to be a better pilot. After this, my next flight was with my instructor and we practiced go-arounds, but I'm not really satisfied that I've solved the problem. You see, every time I schedule an instructor, they ask me, what would you like to work on, which is a valid question, but I think I need some structure. I then tried to find some kind of recurrent training syllabus for GA pilots, and I'm not finding anything. I'm thinking something along the lines of a beefed up BFR every six months. I want to have a written syllabus that I can share with an instructor so we both can know what the lesson should look like. Do you know of any programs like this that I can model on? What would you recommend to get someone from a low time, low experience pilot to a safe, competent, and confident? pilot. Eric, thanks so much for your question. First of all, I'm happy there was a gap there in the trees. Uh, if, if there hadn't been, boy, I hate to think what the outcome might have been. We never want to have to uh, rely on that kind of luck. But I think you're asking the right questions, which is, how do we as pilots stay on top of our game so that we don't have to rely on luck when we run into these kinds of situations? And sadly, there are not a whole lot of recurrent trading syllabi available in the general aviation industry, at least for the kinds of planes you're flying. Now, once you step into high-performance, 
performance aircraft, uh, turbines, twin engine aircraft, things like that, then you're more likely to encounter uh, this kind of materials. Now, two of them that I can think of, one, the uh, CART program, which is a weekend training course that I used to teach in that's provided by the Cessna Advanced Aircraft Club. However, it's really just for one aircraft, and that's the old Columbia 400, now the Cessna 240 Corvallis. Or from Cirrus, they have many, many, many different types of recurrent training resources. For example, right now I am looking at a document called the Cirrus Syllabus Suite, the instructor version. And what it says is that after initial training, after someone initially gets checked out on a Cirrus SR20 or 22, a 90-day refresher course is recommended, and there's a syllabus for that. And they go on with subsequent adherence to a six-month recurrence check schedule. And they actually have two different syllabi for these six-month schedules, and they're alternating. So one is a six-month check schedule A, and the other six-month check schedule will be. Now, there's a little bit of uh, difference between uh, each of these uh, syllabi. Uh, what I can tell you is, uh, just in general, the 90-day skill refresher covers normal operations, maneuvers, and special procedures. When you get to the six months checks, the uh, Schedule A uh, has normal operations, instrument procedures, abnormal operations, and then single pilot resource management. And Schedule B would consist of normal operations, maneuvers, special procedures, and single pilot resource management. Now, if you do this on a regular basis, the idea is that essentially uh, every year you would end up completing both a flight review and an IPC. And if you're not an instrument rated pilot, then they suggest you use the instrument procedures portion of Schedule A to maintain your basic attitude instrument flying skills. And just to give you a flavor for what some of these things are, uh, under maneuvers, they're the kinds of things you would expect, power off stalls, power on stalls, slow flight, but also autopilot stall recognition, which shows how an autopilot could accidentally start to pull up and bring you into a stall under certain conditions. Under special procedures, they mentioned short field landing, power off landings, go arounds, and 0% flap landings, which would be flaps up, which in a Cirrus is particularly challenging, uh, relatively easy in a Cessna, but pretty challenging uh, to do that in a Cirrus. And let's see some of the other areas here and under abnormal operations, electrical malfunctions, and then primary flight display malfunction while in VMC, under instrument procedures, basic attitude instrument flying, and unusual attitudes. And then they list additional tasks if you want to complete an IPC while doing that, and they would be the typical things which are listed for an instrument proficiency check. So I think, Eric, what makes the most sense is for you to probably go ahead and create your own syllabus. And I think you could probably use some of the ideas we've shared here and then meet with your CFI and maybe the two of you together can agree on a plan that's going to help keep you uh, safe, competent, and confident. Thanks so much for your question. And if you have a question and you'd like me to answer it on the show, please go out to aviationnewstalk.com, click on listener questions up at the top, and then you can record your question. I'll play it here on the show, or you can send me an email. Just go to aviationnewstalk.com, click on contact on the top of the page. As always, we'd love to hear from you about anything. And if you think that someday you might buy a new or a slightly used Cirrus, please contact me now. Today, pick up the phone so I can help arrange a free demo flight if you're considering a new Cirrus, but also to help you understand the many factors factors, not all of which are obvious if you're buying a new versus a slightly used Cirrus. I specialize in the Cirrus and work with people around the country. And finally, if you love this show, please show your friends how to find the podcast on their smartphone. Until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. <laughs>